Hello, hello, hello. How's everybody doing? I hope good. Good. Today's going to be an interesting one. Something you want to really pay attention to because it's going to be important. It's Jesus is teaching us something here. That all, all of us, me included, you included, need to know and need to learn. Before I begin, uh, it, we're going to be talking about our spiritual lives independent upon the value and benefits of our Lord's death on the cross. A weekly observance of the memorial helps us to live appreciatively and accordingly. According to what? According to God. Father in heaven, as we, raise to, as we rise today, please let us be filled with your spirit. Let us desire to become more like you and to worship you in all that we do. Help us to desire the understanding and the, desert and the discernment and knowledge of what Jesus, of what you, Lord, you felt on the cross in your heart as you paid for our sins. Come fully into our situation, both group as a group and as an individual. Uh, and, and sort out all that muddled feelings and distorted thoughts and that plague us. Cover us with the blanket of honesty and patience, Lord, that is not of this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to talk today about the, the Lord's Supper. Right? So that's, uh, it's referred to as the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, uh, the Supper of Christ, and I guess there's other names they call them. They call it, but it's it's the Lord's Supper. It's just that just seems easiest for me. So, a, an act of worship in in which we engage each week is the Lord's Supper. So, what they're saying is an act of uh, an act of worship in which we engage each Sunday or each week is the Lord's Supper, and that's the taking of the communion. That's the the consuming of the communion, the bread and the wine, uh, known as communion. One Corinthians ten sixteen, and the breaking of the bread, Acts two forty two. Some refer to it as the Eucharist or the breaking of the bread, uh, or the uh, today, some people refer to it as the Eucharist, right? So they, from the Greek, uh, it, in Greek language, it means giving of thanks. And what you're doing is you're accepting that. When you take it, you're giving the Lord of thanks. You're giving the Lord, uh, giving of thanks to the Lord, which Christ did at the time of his institution. Matthew 26, 26 and 27. It's a simple act in which those who are Christians partake in unleavened bread and they drink a fruit of the wine, drink the fruit of the wine, of the vine. And that would be his blood. The, the unleavened bread would be his body. And that would be Christ's body. And the unleavened, the unleavened bread would be his body. And the fruit of the vine would be his blood. It's an important act. Uh, one, we should understand why we do it, lest our participation be displeasing to God and meaningless to us. So when you go to get your communion, if you don't actually know what you're doing or why you're taking it, it's displeasing to God. You're faking him. You're trying to trick him to think, to get him to think that you, I got this. You don't have this. Regardless of whatever your your background is, or your or your or anything for that matter, you don't got this. All right, the Lord's got this. And and it's very detrimental to us. One Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Therefore, it behooves Christians, all Christians, especially those new, those new in uh, the, the, 
the relationship, well acquainted with the meaning and the practice of the Lord. Uh, of the Lord. All right, so of the Lord's Supper. I have to adjust this so I can see all of it. My memory isn't all that good, so I can't re memorize the stuff like the, you see these pastors do online or on TV or priests. They, they spit that right out like they just read it. I, I can't do that because my memory isn't like that. My brain has been jolted several, one too many times, I guess. All right. So the meaning of the supper, it's a memorial. Um, Paul's account is given by the Lord himself. 1, Colossian, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. We eat the bread in memory of his body. That's why you take the unleavened bread from the, that biscuit wafer looking thing that a priest would give you or, or a pastor would give you or a clergy would give you. We drink the cup, fruit of the vine, in memory of his blood. That's and it, oh, it's it's not wine; it's grape juice. All right, Welch's grape juice. That's all it is. But you're doing that uh, as in respects to uh, the memory of his of his blood. So his blood is when he was on the cross. All the blood that got got. Uh, let out that, that just come out of his body while he was being tortured and then on the cross with the with the holes in his hands his feet the the um, <clears throat> the crown I couldn't think of the way I got lost see I told you I can't memorize this kind of stuff I have to read it and see it so it, it, it just helps to memorize that. Where therefore where therefore we therefore we therefore commemorate the death of Jesus on the cross. Uh, Matthew 26 verses 28. Whose death the new covenant is possible. Without Jesus doing this, there would be no New Testament, there probably would be no new covenant. Or there would be probably uh, things wouldn't be the way they are today. Uh, whose blood was shed for remissions of sin, Ephesians 1, 7. As the Passover was a memorial commemorating Israel's deliverance from Egypt through the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. If you remember, you saw movies where you watched uh, the, the Passover was there where where they would wipe blood. Now, that had to be, that blood couldn't just be from any any goat or any animal. That goat or sheep had to be pure. It had to be pure so they can wipe that over the doorway of the person. That's Passover. And what, what it's saying is, Satan pass over me because, or God's wrath pass over me because of the lamb's blood so i got this is a christian family a holy family where we're we're saved we're believers in christ and everything that's who's behind the door when you paint that red strip when you would see them brush that red strip on with with uh, paint brushes that's what it was it was just it was the passover and that it was the blood but it had to be pure had to be pure blood because it's because Jesus is pure. And everything that he died for, he made pure because he gave it a new life. So the supper is a memorial of our Lord's death who makes it our deliverance from the bondage of sin possible. It's a proclamation from Jesus. We proclaim that our faith and he efficacy of the Lord's of the Lord's death 1 Corinthians 11 26 a 26 a when you hear someone say a verse 
and they'll put the letter A or B into it. They're talking about the beginning of the verse or the if it has several sentences in it or several lines long or words long, they'll they'll separate it. So you you're not spending all day trying to figure out what did he mean it here, did he mean it here, did he mean it there, did he mean it here? You're just going to look at it and see 1 Corinthians book, uh, chapter 11, verse 26a. It's the first part of the verse. That's what the alphabet means when you see that in scripture. All right? That his death was indeed for our sins. If we don't believe he died for our sins, why keep the supper? So here's, here, here's how it's important for us. Okay. So you're taking the the Eucharist, we'll call it, or the or the, the Last Supper, the, the communion from your clergy, whoever it may be, a, a deacon, a bishop, a, a pastor, a church. I mean, a priest, uh, an arch, uh, whatever, whatever they call them out in a religion, Catholic religion. I don't know. All right? When we when we take the communion from that person, from whoever our clergy is, we're telling God we believe. And this is why we believe. We're showing him this is sanctification. Right? So when those of you get up there to get your communion, you, you really shouldn't. You shouldn't even approach communion, regardless of, of your what religion you are but, or in what re type of a relationship you have with God. You should not take the, the communion if you have doubts or don't believe in what Jesus did for you on the cross. If you do, you're mocking God. You're going to insult him. And I'd be insulted too. My son died on that cross. And you're going to get up here and tell me you don't believe, and yet you're going to get that glass, that little sip of wine, and and the body in this, in this, in the blood of my son. Don't take it. Don't take communion. I tell you. Now there are religions and relationships that are people have with God that says, you know, that they feel that they can take it. Well, I'm telling you now what the Bible says. The King James Bible, the Bible that God follows and goes by because it's his words. All right. I'm only telling you that you don't have to believe anything I say. I'm putting scripture out there for you. If you don't believe me, go look. If you don't believe the King James Bible, then, then it's on you. But I'm telling you, that's the King James Bible is the one that's followed and God and was it was inspired by God, not anything else, nothing else, no other kind of Bible did. If you look at the King James Bible, it tells you it's the inspiration of God. So you're mocking him if you do that. You don't want to take communion if you know you're wrong. And being wrong is you shouldn't take the communion. That does not help. Now, some priests, some pastors, some, let me stop right there. I'm not going to name them all. So some clergy might tell you that uh, go back to your seat or go, go sit down and repent. And then you can take Passover. I mean, uh, I meant communion. So you're repentant of Jesus. By doing that, you're saying now that you believe in him and that you need him to save you. So you're doing it. But you should repent. You don't just go and take communion of God. That'd be like walking in while he was having the last supper saying, yo, can I get some? Not going to happen. We also proclaim our faith to the Lord's return. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26b at the end of that verse. What is 
for it is to be done till he comes. If we don't believe he's coming, then why keep the supper? So why are you doing that if you don't believe in what Jesus did for us and what he's he said throughout his time on earth? Then you have people that'll say, you know, I, I believe there's a God or a higher power that we're, that's over us. And, and I understand that, but I don't think there's a hell or I think there's a hell that's not that's here on earth and not wherever. You're confusing yourself and you're getting twisted because Satan's playing games with your head. Every time you say that to yourself or think that, and you just, that's like opening the door saying, come on in. And then he comes in and then you sit there and try to say something like that. That's all that is. You got to not, you, first you got to identify the fact that your mind is being played by Satan all the time. So anything other than this rotten, evil, jerk-off kind of stuff that's happening, whether you're putting out there, is not of God. God's of love. God wouldn't put that out there. God's not going to say, I love you, bitch. You know, that's just, I mean, sorry for the descriptive word, but I mean, it's just really, God's not, uh, uh, and a negative evil person God is of love God is love 1 Genesis 1 thus the Lord's Supper looks forward as well as backward and will never observe by his disciples who trust in his redemption and anticipate his return it's a communion it's a communion you have to remember that a fellowship of sharing in the blood of, uh, of Christ. You've heard people say it's all about the blood. It's all in the blood. It's, they're referring to the blood of Jesus. It's all your, your, you want to be saved? Go to the blood of Jesus. Go to the bottom of the cross right now on your own and, and, and tell God you're at the bottom of the cross and, and you're at the blood and you want it to be, you want Jesus to be your savior. That's what all you got to do. And then you're safe. And then you know whatever you're doing. You're just doing whatever. As we partake, we commune with the blood of Christ. Perhaps in the sense of reinforcing blessings we enjoy through the blood of Christ. The blessings through the blood of Christ, it's everything you get. You're, the air you breathe, that's a blessing. The sight you see, that's a blessing. 1 John 1, 7, 9. A fellowship of sharing the blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 16b and 17. As we partake, we commune with the body of Christ. Perhaps it's a sense of reinforcing fellowship together in the body of Christ. Meaning the church. As we break bread together. So when God sat down, he sat down with, he had the manna and he had his body, he had his body and he had his blood. And he tells you that this unleavened manna or unleavened bread is represents his body and the, the juice i'm sure they didn't use grape juice back then but now they do uh that is supposed to be wine but that is uh representative of his of his blood that he's lost for you not for me for you me in my in my world in my life yes jesus died for me not for you but in your world jesus died for you not only everybody else he died for you the extent to which we share the body and blood of the lord as we partake may be uncertain but there we neglect whatever it may be the benefits of that communion and that's what god's saying he's going to give you 
Jesus is saying that you're going to rep this communion will bring blessings. And if you neglect them, that you you dare not neglect them, I should say. I have to get something here to drink. Another cello. Yeah, it's pretty good. Anyway. The Lord's Supper certainly has great significance in everybody's life. Everybody. Not just me. Not just you. Not you, the believer. Not just you, the, the unbeliever. Communion uh, uh, has, a, has a great significance and should not be taken lightly. We do well, therefore, to consider the scriptures reveal about the observation of the supper. It's to be done with reverence, that is, in a worthy manner. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29. The King James Version says, worthily, which some have misunderstood. And that's, that's their understanding of it. And that's because they didn't ask for discernment. To understand what it's saying, ask God for discernment. And he'll give you discernment. With respect to the... Oh, uh, and uh, it's an adverb describing how we take it. Not whether we are worthy or not. With respect to the same to the supreme price Jesus paid for our sins, the cruel torture of humility, uh, humiliation, the cruel torture and humiliation of his physical body. He was tortured and humiliated. They said when Jesus, the the word is that. Theologians and, and these uh, these uh, eschatologists and, and high priests, they all the, the elders they call them, they all they all believe that they they say in in when Jesus was on the cross, he was undef unidentifiable, a person. Couldn't look and say, yeah, that's the guy. It all blended together. The blood, the dirt, the sores, the open wounds, the flesh hanging down. It was all blended together. It just looked like a blob of like uh, pizza cheese. Or something like that. I, I don't I don't I don't know how to describe it, but it was it was horrible. It was horrible what they did to him. I, I'll tell you right now, if I were there, I would have been fighting some people. That wouldn't have gone down. That way. God would have had to hold me off somehow. With respect to a seen price uh, to the supreme price Jesus paid for our sins, cruel torture, humiliation of the of his physical body body the spiritual anguish suffered as jesus bore the punishment for our sins he said my god my god why have you forsaken me jesus said those words on the cross so that blob of just flesh tortured brutalized flesh said my god my god why have you forsaken me you know why he asked that if you've seen movies, they represent that. How they represent that is by the clouds. They'll turn the clouds all black and wild looking and moving the clouds like a storm's coming in or a tornado or something. And that's how they display, that's how they describe, um, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's showing how God has forsaken uh, Jesus, he didn't forsake them. No, that's that's it's true. Why have you forsaken me? God turned his head away from Jesus. That's what happened. 
And for that split second, Jesus felt it and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Failure, number three, failure to observe with proper reverence, bringing condemnation. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29. One, one will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. One will eat and drink judgment to himself. All right, so you know what that one is. So you remember he had the two thieves on each side of him. He had on his cross, he had on his left, he had the, the nicer guy that was a little more understanding and loving towards and compassionate towards Jesus. And then on the other side, you had a, a one that was just a, a, another criminal who was just, uh, they, I think they both were thieves. And the one on the right was the evil one. Not so much evil, but just that he he didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't believe that what Jesus did. He doesn't even know who the person is that he's standing next to or that he's hung on a cross next to. He has no clue. So it, it's blah, blah, blah. You talk all this and that, and now look at you. Well, he is the one who will eat and drink judgment to himself on his way to hell, probably. To make a light of the memorial puts on in some categories as those who mocked him as be hung on the cross to be uh, to be done with self-examination, such as reflecting upon one's spiritual condition. You're sort of in a bind if you're hanging on a cross and your knees get whacked. That means your knees are getting broken, so you can never walk again. And, and uh, or you'll walk in a lot of pain and suffering. And, and, and that's pretty much it, all right? Are we living in a manner that shows appreciation for a sacrifice? By accepting the grace of God in our lives, by accepting what Jesus did for him. Okay, so the grace is what you're accepting. You're accepting God's grace. You're saying, thank you for, for saving me. All right. Now you have to say, well, where did the, what is the grace? Well, the grace is what Jesus did on the cross for you. When he died, he, he was buried and three days later rose again and is seated at the right hand of God. But what I'm getting at is uh, you're, you're now seeing that he, he did this for you. You're clean. You're sinless right now. The moment you're saved, you're sinless. So you have a touch of uh, an intimate touch from God. You're sinless. If you were to die at that split moment, you're going to heaven. Doesn't matter what you did. What you, that's why Jesus died. So now you don't have to worry about what you did or what you said or who you're talking to or what you're doing or or anything. How you how you go and con people or trick people or you don't have to worry about all that. But I will tell you this: now that God's invested in you. <laughs> You better not dis disappoint him, man. Because, because and it's easy to, because Satan's going to be in your ear every day, as he is mine, every day. <clears throat> we live in manner that shows appreciation for his sacrifice by accepting the grace of our God in our lives, and by living for Jesus who died for us. So you live for him. You carry on what he said. And you do that because you love him. You don't do that because you're just hanging out and you need something to do. If you're going to do that, it's because you love him. Regardless of what goes in, on in your mind, it's because you love him. That's why. And, and, and now, now that you know that, now you got to think to yourself, why am I keep thinking this way or that way? 
And I'll tell you why. That's Satan. Satan's putting that in. All Satan wants you to do is like God did to Jesus. That's all. He didn't make it up. God did it already. He didn't make it up on his own. Like, hmm, how can I? He didn't do that. Satan said the same thing God said. God said he, well, God didn't say it, but he turned his head away from Jesus. Well, that's what Satan wants you to do. Turn God's head away from you. His other child. That's what God wants you to do. I, I mean, that's what Satan wants you to do. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean God. Because you turn your head away and you're going to get still filled with these weird thoughts and stuff like that. You're not really going to be asking for forgiveness. You're, you might be, but you're not meaning it. When you mean it, you do it. Otherwise, you're, you're all of words and there's no fruits, none. You're not going to produce any fruits. Guaranteed you're not going to. Hey, look at that. It's right here. Or are we by willing sinning, by willful sinning, guilty of having trampled the son of God underfoot? Counted the blood by which we were sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. I'll tell you what, if you if you do any one of those, you're, you're going to hell. I mean, I, I don't know how else to tell you, except you're going to hell. Um, you need to be saved because otherwise you're going to hell. You need Jesus in your life and you need to you need to repent. From thoughts like that. You repent from those thoughts. Do we by refusing repent our sins. Crucify again for themselves the son of God. And put him to a shame. Hebrews 6, 4 and 6. In one sense the supper is very private matter between Christian and his or her God. It's a private matter. That supper. A time to reflect on past and to resolve for the future to be done with other Christians. So together, that's how we got a church. That's where you go every week. If you go to a church, a building called a church, and you and you uh, are into to that and you're 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 performing <coughs> <coughs> you're performing you know praising God and glorifying God that's what you're doing <coughs> when we come together when they came together they were uh, wait for one another. They were to wait for one another. So they were to wait until everybody got there. In the church. Or in the place where the last supper was going to be. 1 Corinthians 11.33 Partaking together of one bread. They demonstrate that they were one bread and one body. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. We commune not just with the Lord, but with one another. You know that. You're partaking with other Christians, which is what Jesus wants you to, to, to do. You don't just, in a church, I've seen in the Catholic church, you get up from the pew, you walk to the center aisle, and you all walk up two lines. And you just receive communion. And you don't even receive the blood of Jesus, just the body of Jesus. I'm going to have to end this really quickly 
right now I have an emergency I have and I, I will come back on here before I'm done. So 